Excellent. And I want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, again, please feel free to type your questions or comments into the chat. Um, and I can also, uh, I can pose them later, or you can choose uh, uh, to note that you'd like to pose your own questions and, and we can go ahead and um, uh, unmute folks one by one. Um, I'll be sharing some more information about Professor Day in the chat. You can go ahead and um, click through on those links to her uh, books and articles. Uh, I want to, again, apologize for the, for the Zoom settings. I assure you, as Professor Day and I have discovered over the past year, that they are unfortunately necessary. Um, there are some, some bad apples. Uh, that, that make this, these settings necessary, very, very, very bad apples indeed, um, that, uh, that make this necessary. And so unfortunately we have to use these settings to, to make sure that the event runs smoothly. Um, but I do hope that uh, many of you will join in uh, the discussion later. You can um, go ahead and type your questions in the chat. Um, and Professor Day noted that you, you should feel free to type your questions in the chat throughout the duration of the talk if you'd like to. Um, uh, so if we, we can uh, sort of sift through those questions also, I can pose them or you can pose them yourself, but you can feel free to flag questions throughout the duration of the talk. Those will, will not be pinging or dinging or anything like that. Um, this uh, event is made possible by the History Department at, uh, here at Cal State San Bernardino, the History Club, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Senior Faculty Research Fellowship, the Intellectual Life Fund, and academic programs. Um, and I want to especially thank uh, Pamela Crossan, uh, who's joining us again today. Thank you, Pam, uh, in the History Department office for all that she does to make these events possible. Uh, great thanks uh, first and last to Professor Jenny Huang Fu Day, our guest today. Her talk is titled Qing Travelers to the Far West, Diplomacy and the Information Order in Late Imperial China. Uh, professor Day is Associate Professor of History at Skidmore College. She obtained her uh, MA and PhD in History from the University of California, San Diego, and her BA from the University of Washington. She grew up in Guilin, Guangxi, uh, and these days she spends most of her time in Saratoga Springs, New York, close to where I grew up, actually. Professor Day has published works in intellectual, cultural, and diplomatic history of late imperial and modern China. Her in history, but also challenges disciplinary boundaries, integrating literary analysis, communication studies, and legal history into her historical work. Uh, her monograph that we'll hear about today, Qing Travelers uh, to the Far West, Diplomacy and the Information Order in Late Imperial China from Cambridge University Press is, um, is an example of this type of interdisciplinary work. The book is named one of the outstanding academic titles of 2019 by the Association of College and Research Libraries Choice Magazine. Professor Day is also the editor of Letters from the Qing Legation in London from Shanghai Guji Press or Shanghai Classics uh, Publishing House. Um, and also I have links uh, to these and other articles in the chat and description. Professor Day is currently working on a new book project we were just uh, talking about in international law and transnational fugitives in modern China. Her focus in this work has been on the mobility of transnational revolutionary networks. She's examining the evolving legal and judicial institutions that shaped the interactions between these networks and nation states. This work will reconsider the Chinese, uh, the Chinese revolution from the of interstate justice and international law as an evolving and contested space. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome uh, Professor Jenny Huang Fu Day. Please join me in giving her a virtual welcome. Thank you so much, Jenny, for joining us. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your invitation and for uh, providing this wonderful platform to share my book. Um, I wanna make sure my voice is coming through, all right. Yes, great. Um, it's great to see everyone here. Thank you so much for being here and for your interest in my book. Um, my plan is, um, I'll first talk a little bit about why I wrote the book the way, the way I did. Um, and then I'd like to focus on some of the central questions I asked in the book. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with a few words on the work that I've done since the publication of the book in 2018. 
All right, I, I will begin with, um, let's see, um, some of the stock images when it comes to the subject of China and the West. And um, there are certain images that come to the mind that make up the larger historical narrative. Um, there is the image of Lord McCartney going down on one knee in front of Emperor Qianlong. Um, there is, of course, the well-known image of the nemesis destroying the Chinese wooden junks in the First Opium War. And then, of course, there's the famous uh, Shu Jitu uh, depicting foreign powers carving up China like a melon while the Chinese elites are doing nothing. Now, this narrative has changed somewhat over time, um, but it typically places Westerners as the active party traveling to the East seeking changes and the Chinese were largely depicted as passively responding to these changes. We don't usually think of 19th century Chinese as explorers, travelers, and diplomats making sense of the West, solving diplomatic crises, negotiating deals with foreign statesmen, and putting themselves on public display. I think this is a mistake because the Chinese were, as I argue in the book, all of those things. Um, I also had a great deal of trouble with the underlying assumption that there was some deeper aversion to engaging with the world or even the premise that the Qing failed to realize the advantages of modern diplomacy or that the Confucian conservatives kept the Qing from modernization. I'll give you just one example to show why this way of seeing Chinese is wrong. Now in the year 1887, this is two years after China was defeated in the Sino-French War, a period often de depicted as under the influence of Confucian conservatives. In this year, there were so many officials competing for overseas diplomatic posting that many qualified candidates felt utterly hopeless at the prospect of being appointed. One official had been on the wait list for 10 years and yet the end was nowhere in sight. So he asked uh, Li Hongzhang, one of the leading statesmen of his time, why this was the case. And Li said, nowadays the maritime sphere has become a smooth path to which all court officials aspire, quite unlike 10 years ago. When Emperor Wu of Han first acquired envoys, no one liked the idea because of the distance they had to travel. But once Zhang Qian made his fame, this was uh, around 138 BCE, missions to foreign countries became a matter of course, and everyone competed to talk about the advantages and disadvantages and begged to be envoys. The past and the present are the same. So I think people hold on to these passive images of Chinese diplomacy and overseas travels, largely because of certain methodological flaws and blind spots in how we've searched for and interpreted the literary output from overseas Chinese diplomats. We've been looking at the wrong places and drawing the wrong kinds of conclusions about them. In particular, I think there has been a tendency to privilege um, uh, what Westerners and what later generations said about the late Qing, rather than looking at what people produced themselves during this period. And so this is a source of conceptual bias and distortion. Now the challenge uh, is not in finding these sources. There are actually many kinds of sources out there from archives, official records, private, uh, public sponsored publications and so on. It's not hard to find them but because they don't exist as a coherent body of sources that all look easily identifiable, but rather as many divergent forms of genres of literature, it can be a challenge to access them in the right way. So I think that this very idiosyncratic and scattered nature of the diplomatic output is rather revealing. So in many ways, the book I wrote, Qing Travelers to the Far West, is about rewriting the narrative of Qing diplomacy and information gathering about the West and placing the Chinese at the front and center in imagining and engaging with the West. Instead of summarizing the book, I thought that I could maybe share some of the underlying premises and questions driving the book. So these are the three central questions I asked in the book. Why did the Qing need to send their own missions abroad? What purposes were these missions, especially these early missions meant to accomplish? 
what did these travelers and diplomats actually do in the West and how did they work? What was the larger impact of the textual output of these missions? Did people actually pay attention to what they produced? If so, how? And why did this output fail to have the kind of enormous impact that we often associate with, for instance, the Iwakura mission in Meiji, Japan? And so before I try to answer these questions, I thought I could perhaps take a few minutes and make a few uh, methodological notes and premises. So first, um, communication in my book is used to describe two different processes. There is communication as the transmission of information from point A to point B. And then there was the older uh, ritual view of communication as maintenance of social relationship and shared beliefs. We often only think of the first meaning as communication, but I think that both meanings are important. In fact, we can think of many forms of communications whose primary purpose was actually ritualistic, right? Even newspaper reading was uh, something like that. They were meant to enforce social bonds and establish a shared understanding. And so when we examine the textual output of Qing envoys and diplomats, we have to keep this in mind. And I was inspired by the works of James Carey, who wrote on the theories of communication and the historical impact of telegraphy. And my book owes actually a great deal to his work. And so what I did was I went ahead and um, I mapped um, sort of different genres used throughout this history uh, to these two axes. And so we can see that each of the literary genre used by the Qing diplomat actually differed in their speed of transmission uh, which is according to the first view of communication. And that is represented on the horizontal line here and the scope of their dissemination uh, vertical line here. And that is according to the second view of communication. So on the one side of the spectrum to the far left, we have the well edited but largely formulaic envoy poetry and traveling prose, which were slow to disseminate, but had the ability to reach a larger audience and bring people together in a shared reading space. On the other hand, that's the other end of the spectrum, we have much faster means of communication, the telegraphy, which was efficient, packed with information, but largely as disembodied data, short and extremely limited in their scope of dissemination. And so if we tabulate the kinds of literary output of these missions over time, we actually see a gradual decline in the use of poetry and private journals as a form of communication and an increasing preference for the more detached and impersonal forms of communications which prioritized speed and allowed the diplomats to control its visibility and publicity. And so this is one thread running throughout the chapters, how the tools of communication changed over time and how this impacted the effects of the diplomats work. One observation that we can make is that the adoption of telegraphy prioritized the transmission function of communication. So function number one from point A to point B at the expense of the ritual one. And we can, we can think about how this might actually undermine the Qing government's ability to disseminate a coherent view of the West that inspired cohesion and solidarity. And so that was my first premise. My second premise is that the messages conveyed in these diplomatic communications are not self-evident. In other words, what was transmitted might not align with what was received. I think we've all experienced this to some extent in our daily communications, right? Um, and so I find Stuart Hall's ideas of encoding and decoding really helpful. And so what I did was that I take each mission as a distinct process where the historical experiences of the envoys pass through complex rules of discourse and emerged in the form of messages about the West. And these messages would pass through various decoding processes and yield certain effects on the audience. And what this lets me do is to treat the production and the reception of diplomatic writing as separate processes shaped by different historical circumstances. 
It also allows me to make sense of a wide range of sources across media, looking at journals, poems, travelogues, telegrams, memoranda, memorials, and newspaper articles in the same way. And the conflicting responses from the domestic audience will start to make sense. A related premise is that people actually position themselves in relation to the texts differently. And so unless we take into account of that positionality, it's a little simplistic to take these texts at face value and to take, for instance, acceptance and praise of the West as a signal of a liberal attitude and disapproval and criticism of the West as a sign of ignorance, traditionalism, and cultural isolation. And so let's return to the first question I asked. Why did the Qing feel the need to send their own missions abroad? Now, the obvious reason that everyone can think of is, well, the diplomatic pressure from the West and the urgent need to gather information, right? The West had been doing this for a long time and they seemed to have known everything about China, but the Chinese were largely ignorant about what's out there. And that's certainly true. But I argue that there's also a less obvious reason, and this has to do with the textual representations of the West and the inherent flaws in the literature which was available to the Qing government. In other words, it's not really about knowing the absolute facts, but how these facts are conveyed. And that's what the Qing lacked. Now, up until the mid 1860s, there were two primary compendiums of geographical texts about the world. There was Wei Yuan's Hai Guo Tu Zhi, and there was Shi Jiyu's Yin Huan Zhi Lue. Historians such as Matthew Mosca and in an earlier generation, Fred Drake have written about how these works fundamentally changed the state of Chinese knowledge about the world. And that's absolutely true. The breadth and the accuracy of these works far exceeded what had existed before. But from the central government's point of view, these works also had huge problems because they were static outdated, adopted such wildly different and largely incompatible perspectives. They were a patchwork of translations, paraphrases, hearsay, and traditional Chinese geography. Many of them were based on translated geographical texts from the West and then stitched onto a literary tradition which can only be described as ritualistic and Sinocentric. Most problematically, this type of literature tends to describe European colonialism and imperialism as the moral imperative of a superior culture. The implication of this interpretive framework was seen as um, largely um, highly problematic to the Qing government. And I think it would be to any government. For instance, uh, Shi Jiyu's work describes India's fall to the British forces as the inevitable conquest of a weaker, inferior culture by a superior civilization. Where does that, le where does that leave China, people ask? And so even though um, there might be useful information about the West from these works, they fall short of the second meaning of communication as ritual. They did nothing to sustain a common faith, a, a shared belief in China in the Qing dynasty. So the challenge of these early envoys and diplomats was really how to gather useful information in a textual form that fulfilled the necessary social functions and ritual functions um, and, and also transmitted useful knowledge. Right. And so, of course, aside from this aspect, there were also many other pressing issues that the Qing needed the diplomats for, ranging from negotiations of specific treaty clauses to the protection of overseas Chinese. And I talk about these in the book, but I'm not going to go into detail here. And so let's return to the second question I asked. What did these um, envoys and travelers and, and diplomats actually do in the West? And how did they work? I spent a lot, <clears throat> I spent a lot of attention on this aspect of Qing diplomacy in each chapter. I think there has been a bias in the roles played by Western advisors and friends of the Qing dynasty uh, in studies of these missions. For instance, there have been so many different studies of Robert Hart, but not one on Prince Gong. Uh, 
For another example, the mission of 1868 has often been called the Berlingen Mission. The treaty he negotiated was called the Berlingen Treaty, and a great deal of attention has been paid on how <clears throat> Ensign Berlingen came to be appointed um, and the great speeches he made on behalf of the chain. But a Berlingen centered story obscures as much as it reveals because that's not how the Chinese understood or remembered the mission. Berlingen was assisted and actually managed by two Qing envoys, one Manchu and one Han official, and they had very different ideas about what the mission was about. In fact, as I argue in the book, one of these envoys didn't even think, didn't even consider the mission as something unprecedented or something that's groundbreaking, but rather imagined himself as following the footsteps of Song Dynasty envoys who traveled beyond the northern borders and negotiated with the rulers of the Khitans and the Jurchens. What has been ignored in scholarship then is how the Chinese members of this mission worked, how they observed, how they socialized, how they performed, and how they engaged with diplomacy and tended to the business of administering and protecting overseas Chinese. Now, it's important to observe that the modes of engagement changed a great deal over time. In the past, a lot of scholarly attention has been paid to the spectacles created by the first few missions, right? Members of the mission uh, actually complained that wherever they went, there was always this huge crowd following them. But once the Qing legations and consulates were established and traveling envoys settled down and became ministers, and that started in late 1876, the nature of their work also changed accordingly. The lives of the diplomats were less exciting to the European public or press, and consequently, we see much less news coverage of their activities. Instead, they worked more or less as professional diplomats, making visits to foreign ministries, attending balls and banquets, and writing diplomatic notes in the exact same way as their contemporary European diplomats. Their work became less visible to the public, less exciting, more mundane, but also more integrated into the diplomatic lives of um, Western countries. So here is a list of 15 major issues that the inaugural minister in the London legation, Guo Song Tao, dealt with. And you can see the nature of these cases and where the legation received these cases. And I've actually color coded them. Um, so the legation can, first of all, be requested by the court or the Zongli Yamen or uh, the provincial authorities to approach the foreign office on diplomatic issues which could not be resolved in China easily. Or the minister can initiate his own proposal. Sometimes when he saw an opportunity to advance an agenda or when he had encountered a troubling rumor in the news, he could do that. The legation can also respond to a query made by the British Foreign Office to clarify certain positions or to seek further answers from the Qing government. And finally, the legation can respond to a direct position, uh, a petition from Qing subjects. And this is only the cases managed by the first minister from 1876 to 1878. Uh, and as time went on, legations took on more and more work. One of the key arguments I make in the book is that legations became a kind of hybrid institution and it worked with some measure of independence and actually flexibility in facilitating the goals of Beijing. Um, this chart shows the information networks of the Qing legation and the British Foreign Office. And this, as we can see, actually mirrors another set of relationship, the relationship between the Zongli Yamen and the British legation in Beijing. We usually think of the second one as sort of the primary, but here I've reversed the order, right? Um, so for any given diplomatic issue, information can travel on both or either path. 
And compared to the Zongli Yamen, uh, the Qing legation actually had certain advantages in its ability to receive, synthesize, and disseminate certain types of information and proposals strategically and to channel them into an effective diplomatic claim. It was a small office under the management of the Qing minister. The legation stood parallel to the Zongli Yamen in terms of its asset, uh, access to the throne, its ability to memorialize and to receive edicts directly. It also had quicker access to the world of foreign and treaty port press thanks to telegraphy. And so what this means is that we can see that the legations in between us actually gave it many double characteristics which defy simple categorization. They were integrated into both the European diplomatic order and the Qing's imperial uh, bureaucracy. They were under the management of the Zongli Yemen and yet at the same time stood parallel to that office uh, before the throne. <clears throat> it's important to look at how the legation worked as kind of a node of information integration and dissemination. As we can see here, in many ways, it really paralleled the roles of the uh, foreign office. And so its unique official status would ensure that it was endowed with the kind of authority to represent the imperial government. And yet, paradoxically, um, because that it's located in London, not in Beijing, the nature of its work was largely invisible to domestic officials due to um, the telegraphy and the memorial system. In many ways, the more efficient, um, so going back to, uh, to ways of communication, the more efficient foreign um, diplomats or these uh, residential diplomats resolved any certain issue, the less visible and more secret their work had to be. Uh, conversely, negotiation over issues which attracted public scrutiny often went nowhere. It would be bogged down in these huge debates and discussions and all sides would feel frustrated at their inability to advance the talks. And I think the Sino-French War is an example of that. So what we're seeing in fact is that this system was unable to reconcile these two forms of communication. The fact that legations were not completely subject to the control of the Zongli Yemen has often been seen as somehow a weakness of the system, and I agree. Um, but uh, at the same time, I also argue that this incomplete integration into the imperial bureaucracy also gave the legations certain flexibility not to side with certain political factions and to continue upholding sort of a consistent image of China even during periods of political turmoil. And a primary example of that is during the uh, Boxer Uprising. Aside from the ministers, it's also important to mention the works of secretaries and student interpreters in the legations. Um, in the book, I actually have a chapter on Zhang Deyi. It's actually a lot of fun to write this chapter. Um, here you have um, a picture of him uh, taken when he was, I think, 16. Um, and he ended up going on seven missions and became a minister in his own right. Um, this person practically lived his entire life abroad as a diplomat. As a staff member in the legations, his viewpoints and work habits were very different from um, those of uh, the ministers. He keeps a bulky journal, kind of like an anthropolo um, uh, anthropological field note. And um, I argue that the practical lessons he learned and the notes he took uh, became standard curricular materials for training future diplomats. And then there were also foreign employees, the most important one here being Helde McCartney, the English secretary of the London legation. I couldn't fit this in the book, so I actually ended up writing a separate article about him um, and the other aspect of the legation which came out in Modern Asian Studies last year. And so this figure shows how the Qing minister works with the English and the Chinese secretaries of the legation to produce these bilingual diplomatic notes. It's important to note that the English version of these notes were actually written first. <clears throat> 
And though those were deemed to be the official version and the Chinese version were secondary translations of the English versions. So in many ways, the legation was a linguistically hybrid office. Okay, so um, the bigger point here is that if we compare the diplomatic work done by the legation with the work done by the Zongliyamen in Beijing, then we see a pretty big difference. And here we have two parallel paths of communications between China and England. And so I've um, actually labeled them path A and path B. In path B, um, the Zongliyamen's Chinese messages were translated into English by British secretaries in Beijing based on their understanding of the Chinese language. In contrast, in path A, which is what we're examining here, the translingual job was actually performed by the Qing legation, which rendered the spirit and the intent instead of the language of the Qing government directly into English. And this was done by Haldane McCartney in close consultation with the Qing minister. The Qing legation worked from the assumption that China was a sovereign state deserving a full range of rights guaranteed under international law, um, with the exception of certain treaty provisions. Um, and in these letters, um, they adopted a legal discourse grounded in international law and evidence-based reasoning in negotiation with the foreign office. And so this makes a huge difference in the appearance and the diplomatic claims made by the Qing legation. Okay, and so that's the second question. Now I return to the third question. What was the larger impact of the textual output of these missions? Did people actually pay attention to what they produced? Did people read them? If so, how? And why did they fail to have the kind of enormous impact that we often associate with the Iwakura mission in Meiji, Japan? Um, and so in the, uh, in, in, in the chapters, I trace the impact of the, diplomat, of the diplomats' works, and I find that there was actually a tremendous interest in what they wrote. Um, and this is also an area where not a whole lot of scholarship has been done, and we're largely in the dark about just how the literary output of these diplomats were consumed. And the conventional view is misleading. It has been said very often that, for, for instance, Guo Songtao's journal, the Shi Shi Ji Cheng, where he praised Western culture, uh, was under heavy criticism of con conservative officials. Uh, but I argue in the book that this is not true at all. His works were actually initially published by the Zongliyamen itself to disseminate knowledge about the West. But because there were so many inaccuracies and problematic interpretations in the book that domestic officials and actually foreign diplomats join hands in protesting against it. But even after the book was nominally banned, the ban was not actually enforced and it only became more popular over time. Okay, and so this is one of those books that became a bestseller be because it was banned. The argument that I make here is that there was simply no standard way of consuming and interpreting the literary outputs of these missions and these legations. The whole thing was so new that readers really struggled with how to decipher the information. And it was compounded by the fact that there was no standardized tabulation as the forum used by, for instance, British consuls in their routine diplomatic reports. Each individual adopted a different genre or different genres in their reports and wrote for different audiences. In other words, they positioned themselves with regard to their textual productions differently as literary performance, as a marketable product for entertaining the public, as their own personal and private journal, or as bureaucratic reports written for their superiors. And when telegraphy became more convenient and secure, the entire genre of diplomatic, diplomatic journals became defunct as diplomats turned to sending telegrams to communicate with the central government. And so the problem that we see in this scattershot approach to information gathering is that there was no formal literature affirming a shared understanding about the West during this period. And the result was an, a, 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 a symmetry between the processes of production and consumption for diplomatic communication.
So I think that the answer to the question is that, you know, despite the fact that there was a, uh, a lot of appetite for this type of textual output of the envoys and diplomats, there was no effective way of channeling uh, all of this back into a shared consensus about the world or something uh, that could inspire solidarity among the educated elite. And I would say that this is perhaps a key difference between China and Japan. It's not in the lack of will or the lack of information per se, but a way of keeping peace between two kinds of communications as intelligence information gathering and as a tool for reaffirming shared beliefs and social bonds. In Meiji Japan, we see a much stronger state's role in disseminating discourse about the world and monitoring, regulating, and controlling the press. I think the same thing can be said about many European countries. Dissent was permitted to an extent, but not to the extent that would destabilize the existing social and political order, but the Qing truly lacked these means. But, well, I think that this is um, quite remarkable. Something happened in the early 1890s that momentarily broke that status quo. And this was in the sudden explosion of publicity, of publication of all the literary outputs uh, of, of the legation during Xu Fucheng's reign. Minister Xu owned his own private press. Uh, and he was able to send back the entire bureaucratic and literary output of his legation to be published while he was still stationed abroad. And these works were wildly popular and they uh, disseminated a new view of interpreting the West according to the theory of Xi Xue Zhongyuan and that is uh, the theory that China is the origin of Western learning. And this gave the minister a conceptual shield and allowed him to advocate for the adoption of many Western institutions without being criticized as disloyal. My argument here is that this breakthrough in aligning these two kinds of functions of communication was essential to understanding why there was such an outburst of enthusiasm of Western knowledge in conjunction with the shock effects of the Sino-Japanese War uh, which uh, started in 1894. She actually died just before the Sino-Japanese War on his way back from London. But I think that the impact of his publications were huge uh, on his contemporaries and the next generations. And so that's what the book is about. Um, and I would say that maybe in one sentence, I think the book is about repositioning the Qing at the center and their engagement with the West. If, if there's one larger takeaway from the book, I would say that it's about how an expanded understanding of communication as more than the transmission of pure facts from point A to point B, but as complex social behavior can inform and I hope reanimate the history of diplomacy and China's engagement with the West. Finally, I want to say just a few words about my work on the subject after I published the book. Um, so I delivered this, the manuscript to Cambridge University Press in 2017, but I didn't feel like I didn't feel like my work was done, um, and I feel like it was just beginning in many ways. And um, one of the things that had come to my attention was that there were so many of these legation letters which no one had looked at. Um, this is only one of them. Um, and there were a lot of them. The only copies of these letters were in the National uh, Archives in London. And so I ended up spending about two years going over all of the FO17 files um, from 1876 to 1905. And I found about a thousand of these bilingual letters in, um, uh, in, in this forum. Um, and here is the English version. Um, um, and, um, and I transcribed them and I edited them into a four volume set, which came out last year by the Shanghai Guji Press in a project sponsored by the Fudan University. And I was able to work with a terrific team and I'm truly grateful that they were able to publish it. Again, uh, what's really remarkable about these legation letters is, is that they don't exist anywhere else outside uh, the Foreign Office archive, not even in any of the Chinese archives or personal collect uh, collections that I've seen. 
Um, and, and reading these letters together with the replies of the foreign office, um, it was very helpful because it re restores the diplomatic voice of the Qing legation. And I would say that because of the hybrid in between us of legation, that voice ends up being very different from the Zongli Yaman's voice. Um, the, the, the Qing ministers who issue their letters appear to be far more professional, assertive, and precise in their defense of China's interests on the basis of international law. And so this is also an area where I love to see more work being done by the others. And here are all of the um, FO17 documents uh, that are contained in the set uh, that I published. Um, well, I will end my presentation here. Uh, thank you for listening. I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was, that was excellent and a really great um, introduction with lots more to talk about. Um, I'm going to allow our attendees and some, some claps coming in, virtual claps. I'm gonna go ahead and allow uh, attendees to start video now, <clears throat> if you'd like to, not gonna force anybody, uh, but you can start uh, video. And I know there's some, some familiar faces. There's Paul. I'm also going to allow, um, we'll do, uh, uh, Jenny and I discussed this earlier, we'll, we'll, we'll unmute um, on a case by case. So please, you know how to raise your hand uh, virtually. Everybody's been on Zoom for a year now. So it's in the reactions tab on the bottom there. Um, you, can, you can raise your hand virtually. You can type uh, in the chat, say, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, and certainly if, you're, if your handle is not uh, you know, Zoom Bomber 35, we will be happy to unmute you and you can, uh, you can join the conversation. Um, I don't see any hands yet or, or notes in the comments. So I'm gonna pull rank and quickly ask a question about Manchus and Han, if that's okay. Uh, Cause I remember our, uh, our, our seminars and, and this was always a, an interesting topic in the 19th century. Um, the, the context of the, the tension between the ruling ethnic minority Manchus and the, of, of course the Chinese ethnic majority Han um, in the context of the Opium War, uh, we learned uh, uh, long ago that this was very important. And of course, in the Taiping Rebellion, um, how did this dynamic play out? Did it play out in a systematic way or was it the kind of granular case by case it depended on the situation uh, kind of um, uh, dynamic, uh, Jenny? And, and uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so I actually, um paid some attention to the Manchu-ness of the early envoys. Um, and I think that over time, what you see is a sort of usurpation of uh, the right to be appointed by the, uh, by the Han, uh, Chinese who had uh, affiliations with Li Hongzhang and these provincial officials. Uh, but really the early, uh, the early missions were all headed by uh, Manchus, Mongols, Bannerman, Chinese Bannerman, um, and even their publication circles were sponsored by the Manchus. Um, and I think that that's an aspect that's often been ignored. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, the Manchus themselves also appropriated the discourse of reform. And, uh, you know, they, they also wanted change. They also wanted uh, China to keep sending these missions and to know more uh, about the West. And they argue in their own ways, um, you know, revitalization of their culture, for instance, glorification of, you know, the imperial line, for, for instance. Um, and it's all written in the prefaces um, and in, you know, other literature associated with the envoy journals. Um, and so, um, so I would, I would say that, you know, I, I wouldn't see this as tension, but um, you definitely see that over time, uh, more Chinese officials became appointed, um, especially after this was opened up to be um, sort of more in line with the bureaucratic process. Um, and so you have to be a jinshi or you have to be, 
you know, a Daotai or with um, affiliation or with patronage. And, and so over time, uh, the, the Manchus were sidelined. And even within legations, you see complaints of, of uh, you know, by the Manchus and by the Bannermen saying that, you know, there are these cliques of, you know, these Han officials and they don't let us touch any of the important documents. Uh, we're, we're just, you know, their servants. And so there, there is some degree of complaints, right? But I don't see this escalating, you know, to the point of, of tension. Um, but that's just some quick thoughts there. Thanks, Jenny. And Paul has a, a question. I'm going to go ahead and ask Paul to unmute. Paul, you should be able. There we are. Can, can yes. you hear? Me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I'm curious about the reception of the book in China itself. That is to say, to what extent has the book been reviewed in China? Um, and is there any talk about a possible translation? Uh, do you imagine that there's anything uh, controversial about the book in terms of what the official line is now about you know the century of humiliation, you know, end of story? Uh, would, would your findings uh, you know run counter to that narrative, uh, and therefore the message might not be? Uh, uh, entirely welcome, but you know, have have there actually been any reviews, uh, or have you gotten any kind of feedback from the uh, scholars we we know in China? Thank you for asking that question, Paul. Um, so the book has been um, known and read. Um, by some scholars of um, from from China, and there is actually uh, a plan to have it translated, and I believe by the Shanghai Renmin uh, um, and there are some graduate students working on the translation. Um, and so I think the plan is for that translation to come out in 2022. Um, and um, and so actually, uh, there's going to be a, uh, a sort of, you know, Peng Pai, um, uh, which is a, a really uh, a popular online newspaper for um, sort of academics. Um, they sponsored a roundtable on the book, and it's going to come out in just a few, few days. And basically, this is um, a really interesting process where they send my book to three academics in China, uh, who of course know, you know, who wrote the book and everything, but I don't know who they are. Um, and so they review the book in Chinese and then they send, uh, and so there's an editor, the editor was sent me their comments. And then I am given a space, um, a very generous space to respond to their comments. And then if all of us are happy with what we produce, then we all get to publish, um, you know, as a set uh, in the Peng Pai newspaper. And so that's going to come out in uh, maybe within the week. Um, and so um, there so there has been some interest. Um, and I hope that once the Chinese translation is going to come out, um, more people will come to know it. So far, I haven't really seen a lot of controversy. I think that um, the the theories that I that I use are pretty well known to Chinese academics, and so um, on the whole, I think it has been pretty well received. Thanks, Jenny. I've, I've got a, a, a short list of of questions here. I'm going to ask Sigrid uh, to unmute, and uh, then Jalma and uh, Joseph Weho, and I have a question I'll ask on behalf of Anthony Orbuena. Please, Sigrid, go ahead. Great. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Jenny. It was just great. Um, and I, I have to admit, because this is not my area for research, my mind was just going on teaching the whole time, you know, and thinking about how this would change, you know, the way that we present this whole period and these issues to students. And so um, you know, I mean, part of what we tend to do as research scholars is make things more complex, right? And I think your work, you know, it's clear that that's one of the major contributions is to, you know, stake out this, um, you know, history as, as being more, um, more complex. But at the same time, we kind of have to, we always have to do some form of simplification, right? And the kind of what, you know, so in you know, not wanting to paint with too broad a brush about you know, the Qing response to the West, at the same time, 
you know, when we boil it down, it's like, what, what is it that we want to tell students? And so I'm curious as, you know, both in terms of how you present this material to students, but also, you know, how you, you know, whether there is a kind of, you have a vision of how you would want to see this transform the textbooks that we're, you know, that we're using. All right, I couldn't find the unmute button voluntarily. Oh, Thank you, uh, Sigrid, for that question. Um, so I struggle with this with this a lot. Uh, actually, I struggle with this every single day, um, and um, and I haven't really found a good solution to it. Um, so I I've tended to think that you know maybe the change cannot be done in a single book, but in how we convey and teach in our courses, um, and so. Uh, you know, maybe that's a UCSD thing, right? We always, um, you know, dig up for the human experience and we always try to look for more complexity. But I've, uh, I've been teaching uh, my modern history courses from a bottom up perspective, uh, instead of from a, a top down, because that's the thing that they, they get, they get that anyway. Um, and so what I've done um, in the last few years is that I asked each student to sort of build their own uh, history built uh, to adopt a family in China uh, and to build this family history over a generation, uh, you know, from the 1840s up to the 1990s. Uh, and I, I, I think that once you prime students to, to think this way, it might be a little easier to introduce the need for more nuance and more, complex, uh, more complexity. Um, and so I've really struggled because it's, a, you know, as, 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 as much as I try to condense the book, it's still, you know, 200 something pages and it's impossible to assign it to an undergraduate class. I've assigned it to my seminars, uh, but only one chapter, um, just maybe one or two chapters. Um, and so what I've done is maybe in each chapter, I try to make some of the same points so that you know, even if students only read one chapter, they can get a sense of the methodology, the perspective. Um, you know, I, I don't think that it can, it, it can really change how that bigger general narrative is being conveyed, but, but, I, but I, I would like to imagine that a book like this or even chapters will be more conducive and helpful for professors who want to teach history in a, in a different way. Um, and so less, uh, sort of bigger narrative and, and more in, um, interested in exploring the, the divergent voices, uh, uh, you know, from from the people. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if that's the answer that you're looking for, but you know, all I can say is that it's a great question. I don't really have um, a good solution to it, and thank you for raising it. Thanks, Jenny. I'm going to go ahead and ask Zhao Ma to unmute. And after Jama, uh, uh, you should be there. We go. And Joseph uh, Wayholt is going to uh, jump in after that. Hi, 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 Jenny. So I saw your uh, your ad. You know, <laughs> hi, Jeremy. <laughs> I saw your ad on the uh, on WeChat. So that's I decide. You know, just pop in and listen to your <laughs> your presentation. You know, this is a really wonderful topic, and I, I enjoy it a lot. And so, uh, and especially, I, I enjoy the picture you put on your PowerPoint. You know, one of the picture, one of the pictures you show this is the Qing delegation. Uh, you know, on the uh, you know this is actually you know this is the Qing delegation to the uh, 1904 San Louis uh, World Fair. You know, because I work in uh, Washington University in San Louis, so the picture was taken right outside the building where my office is. So it, uh, you know, I can, you know, that's sort of the connection, not just intellectual connection, but also just a physical connection, you know. So that's really a very, uh, just an interesting note, and just put it all over there. Uh, I think I have uh, uh, two questions, and uh, both in and beyond, you know, your research. And I think one question is uh, is more about the the diplomats, the Qing diplomats. And uh, I want to uh, understand, or maybe you can maybe tell us more, sort of the uh, how they were trained, you know, how they were recruited, how they were prepared before they were put outside, you know, go, go on this, 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 this diplomatic missions. And then uh, uh, maybe could you comment on how their training process, you know, and uh, how their, those, those uh, uh, preparations maybe uh, uh, help them engage with foreign audience 
or maybe limit the ways in which they engage with foreign audience. You know, the reason why I'm asking the question is because I, uh, you know, my work with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, you know, got me into the contact with both the officials in Taiwan and officials in PRC China. You know, so you see how these two different uh, diplomats function, you know, in the world, uh, in, in the United States, it's quite different. So that's why I'm just thinking, uh, uh, could you maybe say a little bit more about their, uh, their, their training process, you know, within in, in Qing China? That's kind of one question. The other question is, uh, uh, I mean, your book and today's talk and focus more on the, uh, the, the diplomats, the official side, their story. And, uh, but I'm just looking at the room, you know, and Paul, you know, Professor Pickowitz, and he just, one of the you know, new books is the uh, China Tripping, right? So you see how uh, intellectuals, uh, you know, scholars, and they all uh, wrote about China and uh, they share in the public domain and uh, become really the part of how we, we know China in this country, in the United States. So I just want, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, do we have uh, the kind of, you know, uh, talking about the West, but not by the China officials, you know, but by maybe merchants, you know, students, and uh, uh, though you know, people study abroad and people who traveled abroad, or when we begin to see uh, the kind of uh, that type of literature, you know, not just from the official side, but from more the, the public side. Thank you. Thank you for these great questions. Um, so um, so uh, as to the first question, the training and the preparation, um, to put it simply, I think that there are different, not, not just one system, but many different ways in which a person can become a diplomat. Uh, they can be recruited from the Tongguan um, and then brought up. They could you know, take classes uh, with uh, Martin, W.E.P. Martin, uh, and very often the texts that they would use would be prepared by uh, people like Zhang De Yi, uh, you know, uh, uh, for instance, people who had experience um, in these legations, um, years of training, examination taking, that's one track. And the other track is they could be recruited into the personal uh, circle of one of these legation ministers. And then even without any experience at all, just by their personal uh, association, their loyalty uh, and their understanding of foreign affairs, um, they could be recruited and appointed at a high level, uh, uh, sometimes as attache. Um, and so, uh, so there are, you know, divergent ways in which people come in. And uh, uh, the advantage is that then you have uh, students who are um, more or less semi-professional and, and who know the language and who know the etiquette. Uh, and then you know you have people who could work with the legation uh, minister and who they trusted. The disadvantage of that is then you have separate systems or cabals within the legation. People don't get along and there's suspicion and there's mutual uh, distrust. Um, and so, um, and so I think that um, uh, Li Wenjie's work um, actually does a great deal to sort of clarify this process and then think about, um, you know, mainly the weaknesses of lack of a centralized streamlined professional system to pump the people into uh, these different uh, positions. And I think his work especially engages with the lack of uh, sort of mutual penetration between the people who work in the Zhongli Yaman and in Beijing and the people uh, who are stationed abroad in these different legations, unlike you know, what we see in, in Britain or in many of the other European countries where you see routinely that people you know, would gain experience domestically and then they'd be uh, going out in one of these uh, overseas posts and they would come in. And so there is a sort of um, alternation of these posts. The Qing didn't really have that. They didn't really have that uh, um, until perhaps very last stage. Um, and so that was definitely a, a disadvantage. Um, and so that's, um, and so in, in the book, I actually talk a lot about this, uh, mostly uh, in chapter three and four, where I talk about the experience of Zhang Yi, and then with Guo Song Tao uh, sort of building up the legation. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I really think that a lot more work can be done and should be done on the subject. And, you know, there's tons of literature out there. Um, uh, the Xiaofang Hujai collection has so many different 
you know, idiosyncratic pieces, you know, collection, uh, you know, personal recollections or manuals written by uh, these diplomats or semi-professional envoys. And so and there's really not really, you know, a, a kind of coherent study of the subject. Um, as to your second question, merchants and students and other peoples studying abroad, um, my sense is that there is a lot, um, there is a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of work out there, but they're scattered. Um, and, and, and sometimes you see them appearing as newspaper articles. Sometimes you see them in personal collections, uh, but they're really, you know, we haven't really um, had um, any scholar, as far as I know, from English uh, language going into these sources and really making sense of them. In my book, I try to stay away uh, from the experiences of the non-officials because the emphasis here um, is really the building up of an information order, um, you know, by the Qing government. Uh, and so that's why, you know, even though I gathered a lot of sources from these, you know, other voices, um, I try not to go into it because I wanted to sort of think about these as different discourses and, and to evaluate the success or lack thereof of the Qing government in controlling, disseminating uh, its own discourse about the West and, 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 and to see the uh, interactions between the official and the semi-official discourse. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I, I really see this as sort of maybe just, a, you know, one book out there. And I think that more works on the subject should be done on, uh, you know, different impressions of, of people uh, abroad. Thank you so much for asking that question. Thanks, Jiaohua. Thanks for joining us. And I wanna ask uh, Joseph to unmute in just a second. I'm also going to change a setting now. I'm gonna allow people to unmute themselves because I think Sigrid had a, a follow-up there and she wasn't able to unmute. So I'm gonna ask Joseph to unmute and I'm going to change the settings. Please note, I, I don't think I'm gonna unmute everybody, but I might. Uh, so just be ready. Uh, I'm going to allow everybody to unmute themselves as of right now. Um, so please watch that you don't accidentally unmute yourselves. Um, and we'll have a, you know, we'll have a classic uh, 2021 Zoom situation going on. But I, I just wanna flag that for everybody. Uh, so everybody is able to unmute at this point. Um, for things like Jama or, or, or Joseph or, or Sigrid to follow up on their question. Okay, Joseph, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And Jenny, it's great to see you. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. I learned so much. Uh, just a couple questions about the, the, the materials that you've worked with. Um, I was curious about the, the kind of bilingual nature of the foreign office files. If you could speak more about the process of translation, um, what was involved perhaps, and if you found any discrepancies in which the translator was being creative either in the Chinese or the, or the, uh, the English. Um, and the second question following up on that is, did you have any surprises in the archive that didn't make it into the book um, or the edited volume that you would like to kind of talk about in terms of surprises or, or interesting stories that you came across? Thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, I, there's so much uh, that I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of the process of, tra uh, of translation. Um, and that's actually why I ended up writing the second, uh, sort of the, the article to follow up uh, the book. Um, yes, it's all about discrepancies. It's all about, um, and so I actually don't think of it as a translation. I, I really think of that, that process of creating the Chinese texts based on the English diplomatic note as a recreation um, of something that conformed to the Chinese view. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the discrepancies um, would range from being much, much shorter, uh, much more um, succinct uh, to sort of eliding certain words or concepts that are, you know, that, that you can't really present in a Chinese form. Uh, for instance, it, you know, in one of the uh, uh, in, in one of the diplomatic notes, where let me get this right, I think, I think um, the Qing legations were arguing that Chinese overseas were being discriminated against because there was a separate poll tax uh, that um, you know I think it was chi Chinese in, in Canada, and so McCartney 
uh, was in his English version actually used the Chinese example of sort of labeling foreigners as the barbarians as E uh, and, and saying that, you know, you criticize us for doing this to foreigners and now uh, you're doing this, the exact same thing uh, to the Chinese, uh, you know, um, and, and, and of course the, you know, the entire section, which is brilliantly written, uh, very eloquent, uh, made no appearance in the Chinese edition uh, of, uh, you know, the translation. Um, and so that's number one. And so, you, you know, you see that the Chinese texts are much shorter. Sometimes there are no Chinese texts at all. Um, you know, and, and that suggests to me that, you know, um, that there, there is a high degree of flexibility and independence, you know, uh, of action uh, and, and confidence accorded to McCartney. He can deal with foreign office as a representative of the Qing and doesn't necessarily have to be archived in uh, the Chinese form. And so you see lots of examples of that. Um, and the other thing, and I think that one of the surprises that I found is that uh, the Chinese that you see in these Chinese uh, uh, recreations of the English notes, they're not very good Chinese. Um, sometimes they barely make sense. Uh, you see that a lot of the words are being made up on the spot. Um, and uh, so they're not just much shorter, they're also very awkward. Um, and, and so that begs the question of, you know, were they really meant to be read by uh, Qing diplomats or by officials in the Zhong Yaman? Were they actually sent back to be scrutinized? Maybe they weren't. Maybe they were just left in the legation. And that's why we don't really see any, uh, you know, evidence of this in the Chinese archives. And that prompted me to make that argument uh, that the sort of the distance of the legation was actually to the advantage of the independence of legation, they could negotiate things, you know, ne without necessarily the, the interference of domestic officials. Um, yeah, so that's just a quick uh, response to those two great questions. Thank you so much for asking them. Thanks, Joseph, and thanks, Jenny. I, I had a quick specific question. Um, we, we may aim for the 115 local time, so at about uh, six minutes or so, but we can run a little long if, if the conversation continues and, and, and uh, uh, Jenny doesn't mind. Uh, we, I, I have a quick specific question. Actually, Anthony, Joseph asked in part Anthony's question, which was really nice. Uh, um, uh, Anthony uh, Orabuena above asked about your, fa your fondest memory uh, and, and surprising things that Joseph asked for. Com combined a little bit with that. Um, I wanted to quickly ask about um, how those communications got into the National Archive in London. Were they seized? Were they, uh, were, were th these are, I, I assume, um, Qing official documents. Uh, were they seized in 1911, 1912? Um, were, they, uh, were they handed over voluntarily? Were they public? Were they open? Um, I was just interested that they're that they're in London, which is great. Uh, but uh, do you know how they got there? Yeah. So let me share my screen uh, very quickly, and I think that this will clarify things. These were all taken from the Foreign Office files, and so F F F O seventeen is where um, you know where they keep all the correspondence with. Uh, anyone who worked on, on China, so uh, Chinese legations, Chinese uh, diplomats, uh, or sorry, um, British diplomats in Beijing. And, and so they're not actually seized. These were letters that are sent uh, from the legation to the FO. Um, and so I got these from the binder of, you know, so what, what you see is that you'd have the letters and then you have the drafts by, for example, uh, uh, Lord Salisbury uh, in response to these letters. And, and so uh, they, they were actually intended only for the eyes of the British uh, foreign officials, not really for uh, the chain, right? Um, and so that's, that's how they came into the foreign archives. Thanks, a quick, a quick answer to a misguided question, very good. I, I I wasn't sure if the what, what the what the nature of those were, but thanks for for that. I um I'm wondering if you're aware of the the 
the document, sort of repository, the FRUS, Foreign Relations of the United States, um, which is so wonderful for me as uh, an instructor in a school where not a lot of my students, not a lot of my history students are gonna have Chinese language ability. And it's such a, such a wonderful um, repository, vast amount of materials, much of which have to do with American diplomats in China. And so I send my students to that online database. Um, and, and I was wondering if, if you are aware of that and the kind of tone and tenor of the sort of exchanges that are going on between American um, uh, official uh, figures in China back and forth um, talking about uh, China in this period, because it goes back quite far. It goes back into the, um, I think it might go back into the, the early 1900s and maybe even, even further. Uh, do you know about that, that, that database? Have you, have you used it, the FRUS, the Foreign Relations of the United States? Not for the, not for my, uh, my book, not for my existing research, but I will be looking for this uh, for my next book on the transnational fugitives, because um, as it turns out, a lot of, uh, a lot of these, you know, would be revolutionaries use the United States as, um, as their base. Um, and, and so there's a lot of discussions about, you know, does the US need an extra uh, extradition treaty with, with the chain? And if so, what form does it take? Um, and so I'm just starting to look into that a little bit, but um, it's really great to see that, that you are able to use that. Um, and so if you don't mind me asking, uh, you know, do you find that students actually spend the time to sift through the records and actually dig up information? Or do you think that they just go through the motion? And It's, it's really nicely searchable. Um, it's a, it's a wonderfully searchable database. And anybody who's instructing like me in a, um, in a, in a program where you're teaching Chinese history, Chinese foreign relations, and somebody has to do a paper on a Chinese topic, it's nice to get them some, some primaries in that way. Um, obviously prefer to have the Chinese documents translated into English, but these are original English language documents that are primary voices from that time. It's really, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a helpful thing. The searchability of it is, is quite remarkable um, and is, is really, really handy. Uh, so I just find it a nice, when we talk about primary sources and secondary sources and sometimes problematize the, the, the line between the two, um, these are definitely in that sort of you know, primary source, primary voices category. And they, yeah, they, they, they do pretty well. So there's a tendency to go toward American, China, uh, topics when they work with these documents, but uh, I, I think it makes sense. And, and there's a lot of really interesting materials there. Yeah, it's a nice, it's an impressive database. Um, I do wanna, before, um, thanks, uh, Jao Ma, and, and I wanna uh, convey Joe Eshrick's um, greetings. He had to run to a meeting and sent, sent me a note. Um, and, and before we do break up, I do wanna go back to Anthony's question because I think that that's a fun thing to wrap up with. He asked, um, well, he asked how long you've been, been working on this project, a quick uh, question. But he also said, what's your fondest memory? What's your fondest moment? What's your, what's your favorite part uh, of, of doing this, the, um, this type of study or this, this project in particular? I'll let Anthony have the last question unless anybody else wants to jump in. Thank you, Anthony, for that question. Um, so my fondest memory is, you know, it's it's been little discoveries every day, um, and so there's never really one dramatic finding that you know changed. Um, you know how how I think about these things. I think my, my fondest memory is really it came after I discover uh, I I wrote the manuscript, and it was discovering the hundreds or even thousands of Qing legation letters uh, in the foreign. Um, archives um, and the discovery and the realization that no one had looked at them. Um, and, and so, you know, this is one example where, you know, the work is done, the book is done, um, but then you stumbled upon, you know, this great treasure trove of, of sources. Um, and so what do you do? <laughs> um, so I, I, I decided to take the time and transcribe them so that other people could use them. Uh, because I feel like, you know, there's, you know, so much I can do, and I probably said all I could say about the topic for the time being, but my hope is that 
you know, other people could maybe use them as clues to track down um, things of their own interest. And so I think that my fondest memory is really, you know, it came after uh, my, my book is mostly written um, in a realization that there's so much out there that hasn't been done that uh, needs to be done. That's good. I, that's really good to see that as a fond memory. I see that as terrifying sometimes when I think I've got all these material, I've got so much more that, to, to do, but I, I like that idea and I'll take that on as, a, as energizing and exciting to think about all the, all the work remaining to be done. Um, but this, is, this has been really delightful. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I wanna thank again, Pamela Crossan for, for joining us today and for, uh, for, for all that you do, Pam, to make these events possible. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Joseph and, and Sigrid, um, everybody for, uh, for, for joining us, Josh. Um, and, uh, and, and thanks especially to, to Jenny, to Professor Day for taking us out and wrapping up our, our series of talks this term. I uh, hope I can continue it uh, in the coming year. So please do stay tuned. Um, thank you so much, Jenny. Any, any parting words, any last thoughts? Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here for me. It means a ton uh, to have your attention and your interest. Thank you, Jenny. We'll sign off and I'll, I'll follow up with you by email. Thanks so much, everybody. This was really a delight. And uh, thanks so much, Jenny, for, uh, for sharing your work with us.